Hey everyone, welcome to week 14 of Computer Science 340. This is the final week of our class. And for our final topic, what we're going to talk about is something called Huffman coding, which is a simple way of doing data compression. Now, so far in this semester, we've talked about lots of different ways to store data, especially to make it amenable to do different algorithms with. So like when we talked about linked lists, we talked about how that lets you like remove and insert data quickly. Then we talked about other things like binary search trees that let you search for data really quickly or heaps that let you um, uh, find the biggest or the smallest item very quickly. So a lot of the things we've been talking about, the point of them is been to let us do these algorithms that work more efficiently on them. But today we're going to talk a little bit about how you can store data, not to make it more efficient in terms of like runtime, but how to make it more compact and save space. So there's lots of different ways of doing this, uh, the sort of thing, which is, which is data compression. The one we're going to talk about today is Huffman coding, which is relatively simple. And it's a nice sort of like last topic for this class because it uses some other structures we've talked about. Um, we're going to need to use a, a type of binary tree to do this algorithm. And it also uses a heap. So it'll be a, hopefully a nice little review of things. And it's a uh, nice topic because it shows a way of doing data compression that's pretty simple, but is actually also pretty effective. A lot of other more fancier, uh, more um, compact data compression techniques are based on Huffman coding. So it's a good place to start with this topic. So with that said, let's go ahead and take a look at the basics of Huffman coding. All right, so let's start actually by talking about a few general things related to data compression. First off, there's broadly two types of data compression that you can do. One is called lossless and the other is called lossy. And what the difference between these is, is that lossless preserves all of the information exactly perfectly, whereas lossy can degrade the information slightly. Now you might ask, what is the point of having lossy compression if you're not actually even storing the data and representing it perfectly? But the answer is for things where we value file size more than it being an exact representation. And a good example of this is like the JPEG image file format where we don't necessarily care if you have exactly the right colors as long as it looks close enough to the original picture that the human eye can't tell the difference. So when you save something as a JPEG photo, it will do things like say, oh, these two pieces of green from the leaf in the picture are so exactly identical that a human eye can't tell the difference. So we're just gonna go ahead and say it's the same color. So for photos, most of the time having JPEG be a lossy compression where it slightly degrades the color information doesn't actually matter. Same thing for MP3, where the sound quality will be reduced slightly in order to make the file size extra small. And some people would say, well, you can hear the difference. And that's why some people like to listen to like um, lossless encoded audio files, some people don't care and it doesn't matter, but that's the idea with the lossy thing. We don't need the information exactly a hundred percent correct. As long as it's close enough that we can like enjoy it. We take that trade off to have a smaller file size. With lossless encoding though, you get exactly the same information, 100% identical, which means that you can't get the file to be as small as if you were doing a lossy encoding, but it's important when you want the information 100% right. So if you have a .zip file, for instance, that compresses the files that you put in, but you need them to be 100% right. If you're turning in your project code as a .zip file, you don't want to say, ah, we're gonna change the program slightly because it's close enough. You know, it matters for, for, for documents and for things like that, that it's 100% right. There are other lossless compression formats as well, like .png for images. Those are lossless, unlike JPEGs or uh, .flac, I think is the most popular one for music where it stores the audio exactly as it was in the original file. So there's these two types, lossless and lossy. The Huffman tree, Huffman coding algorithm that we're going to look at is lossless. So it can be used when you want to store the information exactly identical, you just want it to take up less space. Before we can talk about the Huffman coding approach though, first we have a little bit more terminology to talk about. So the first piece of sort of terminology we're gonna talk about is a symbol which is like a single indivisible thing that represents a piece of information. Next, we have a code, which is the set of all possible symbols that you could see. And so if we have a code consisting of the symbols like A, B, C, and D, 
then there are four symbols, A, B, C, and D are all symbols, and this whole thing, the set of them is the code. And then lastly, we have a sentence, which is a string of symbols from a code. So if we have the same code that we were talking about a second ago, consisting of the symbols A, B, C, and D, then A, B, B, C, A, D, A is a sentence of this code. Hopefully that makes sense. It's just a little bit of terminology so that we can start talking about this. So the next thing to talk about are different types of codes. If we have this code A, B, C, D, then our sentences don't need to have any separators. Like if we had a sentence like this, like I just drew, there doesn't need to be any separators between the symbols of the sentence because they are all length exactly one. And even if they were length two, like let's say this is our code, a binary code 00011011, if this is our code, we still don't need to have any separators because it's totally unambiguous where the breaks are because all our symbols are the same size. So we know that every two bits, basically, we have a new symbol and we can divide it up like this. That means that we don't have to put any separators in. But if we have another type of code like this that has multiple length symbols like this one, where we have A as a symbol by itself and C as a symbol by itself, but we also have length two symbols like A, B, and B, C, now we can't just string all the things together like we could in this case and in this case. Because if I do something like this, if I do A, B, C as my sentence, well, there's two different meanings for that. That could either be A comma B, C, or it could be A, B, comma, C. Those are both like valid interpretations of this sentence. And so if we do it like this, where we have a code with multiple different lengths of our symbols, then we might have to put in these separator symbols like this. And that makes it take more space, right? Because then in that case, we'll have to store all the information about where the commas go to. But it turns out that that's not always the case when we have multiple length symbols like this. Sometimes it is and sometimes it isn't. There's a special type of code called a prefix code where we can have multiple different lengths in our symbols, but we still don't have to put the separators in. This right here is not a prefix code. And the reason why is because this A here is the prefix of another symbol in our code that makes it not a prefix code. This code here is a prefix code. None of the symbols are the prefix of another. Here we have V by itself, but none of the other codes start with B, so it's okay. I can just put all these together. I can say A, B, B, C, B, A, C, B, A, B. And it's now not ambiguous where the breaks are because as we're scanning through, we can say, okay, A, B is a, a symbol, so we put that here. B by itself, is a symbol, so we put that here. We don't need to keep scanning because we know that B can't be the start of anything else except for the symbol B by itself because of this like prefix property here. And the reason that this is important to talk about is because the Huffman code is a prefix code. And that has two really nice properties. One is that we don't need to put in separators. And the other is that we can have multiple different length symbols. So now that we've talked about that, I think we can turn our attention to the Huffman code itself. So the general idea behind the Huffman code is that we're going to take our input and we're going to do some analysis on it. We're going to scan through and see what are the symbols, what are the things that appear the most often. And we're going to build a prefix code in which the things that occur the most often have small symbols and the things that occur the least often are given longer symbols. So if we were reading in English text, for instance, we might say, well, space is all over the place. E is all over the place. We're going to give them really short symbols so that when we see them, we can just put in the short little symbol for space or for E or for R or T or S or A or any of the more common letters. But then when we see something like a Z or a J or a Q or an X or one of the less common letters, the less common things that we see in our input, 
they're not as important because they don't come up as often. So we can give it a symbol of length nine or 12 or who cares because it's not gonna happen that often. So we can sort of sacrifice that and have bigger symbols for the things that are less often and smaller symbols for the things that happen all the time, hence compressing the data. And then because the Huffman code is guaranteed to generate a prefix code, we don't need to store in any separators. We can just run all the symbols together and it won't be ambiguous about where one starts and where one ends. So that's the general idea. Let's take a look at how this works by going through a simple example. And let's compress as our example, the text tomorrow morning, just as an example. I picked this phrase because it has some repeat letters in it. Like we have three O's, three R's, a couple N's, and a couple M's. And so our first step for this is we're going to figure out how often each letter appears and assign a frequency to it. So the frequency for T is one, the frequency for O is three, and so on. Then we're going to make binary tree nodes for each individual letter. So O will only have one node in the tree for all three occurrences. All right, so I've made nodes for each letter in this input as our example. So there's a node for T, which has frequency one, a node for W with frequency one, a node for M with frequency two, and so on. Now, the order here is not at all important. I put it in an order so that when we build up the tree, we're not going to have like lines and edges crossing over each other just to make it like visually look nicer. But the order doesn't matter at all. We could have done it in like the order it comes in T O M R W and so on. And that would have been fine as well. I again, just put it in this, in this way so that when we build the tree, it'll look nice at the end, but it doesn't like functionally matter what order these are created in or anything. Then to build the rest of this tree, it's actually kind of interesting because every time we build a tree so far, we start at the root and then we add down, add leaves and add lower levels of the tree as we go. But this time we actually started with our leaves and we're gonna build it up the reverse way and finish with the root node. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to scan through our list of nodes that we currently have. And we're gonna find the two with the lowest frequency and make them siblings of each other and give them a parent. So right off the bat, we can see that T with a one and a W with a one, we can join those together as siblings with the parent. And for the parent's value, we're going to put in the frequency of the two children added together. So one plus one is two. So this parent node gets two as its value. Now we could have, instead of doing T and W, we could have done T and I because they both have one. But that's what I was talking about when I was saying that the tree is going to look bad because if I had done T and I, we would have had these nodes all in between and we would have had edges like looking messy. So it doesn't matter which two you pick if there's a tie as in this case, but I'm just going to choose it to like look like a nice tree when we're done with this thing. All right, so now we continue on and we find the two next smallest nodes. And now we have these two with a frequency one, the I and G. So again, we're going to combine them up with one parent where that parent's value is the sum of the two frequencies. Now we're going to just keep doing this basically until we get to the root. Now we don't have any ones left, but we have some twos. And now we can count not only the leaf nodes with letters in them, but we can count these nodes as well when we're doing this. So for our next one, we can join up the M with this node here and give them a common parent, which would have value four. So the two from this interior node and the two from this leaf node get added together to make the four for this parent node here. Then if we keep doing that, we're going to see that the next thing we have to add together is these two twos. So we make another four node here for them. Then we'll see that the next smallest things we have is the O and the R, which have frequency three. So we can combine them up with a parent of frequency six together. Now we have these two fours to add. So we'll join them up with a parent of eight. And then finally, we have only one step left to do to add the eight and the six together to get 14. And so this is our finalized Huffman tree for this. Now we'll get to actually finding the code out of this in the next video here. But the main idea is that by building the tree in this way, the nodes with the biggest frequency, the leaf nodes with the biggest frequency are closest to the root, whereas the ones with the smallest frequency are further away. So we have these two threes are only one, two steps away from the root node, whereas these ones with 
frequency one are one, two, three, four steps away, and the twos are sort of in between. And so that's going to be how we get the code out of this thing. Again, we'll talk about that in the next lesson, but I just want to give that context for what we're doing here. So the algorithm for this in pseudocode is given here. We, because we're constantly picking out the next smallest node in order to make that more efficient, we're going to be using a heap. So we make a priority queue of nodes such that they're ordered by the smallest priority. So we make a min heap basically. Then we create a leaf node for each input symbol and add it into the heap, into the queue. While there's more than one node in the queue, so if there's more than one node in there, then there's two things that can be joined together to have a parent node. If there's only one thing in the queue, that's what happens when we get to this end state here where only the 14 is going to be in the heap. If in that case, we remove the next two nodes from the queue, and because this is a min heap, we're gonna get the two smallest ones. Then we create a node linking these two as children with probability of the two children summed and add this node to the queue. When we're done that, we're gonna have only one node in the heap, and that's going to be the root of the tree, and it should have a probability of 1.0. In this case, we used like frequency counts. So there's 14 letters and this has 14. So either way it adds up to basically all of the input that you have in your input text. So what's the big O of this algorithm? Let's think about that for a sec. Well, we'll go through this sort of the way we normally do where we kind of assign a efficiency or a big O to each of these steps. Creating a priority queue of nodes is going to be a constant time, just making an empty heap. Then we make a leaf node for each input symbol and add to the queue. So our n here, I think, is the input size of the text that we're doing the compressing on. So this would then be big O of n because we go through each letter and, and make sure that there's a node for it. The way that we're going to be doing our example eventually is that instead of like counting all of the letters, we're just going to use sort of like standard probabilities for English so that like it says that E is the most common. We're not actually going to go through and count them. So this can change slightly depending on like how you're working the algorithm. But then we have this loop here that says while there is more than one node in the queue, that's going to go through all of your N nodes that you just put in you're going to remove two from the queue, that's two times log n, because remember getting something out of a heap is log n time. Creating a node linking those two as children will be a constant amount of time, but then adding it to the heap is going to be again a log n operation. And then this statement here doesn't really do anything that would be a constant amount of time, probably just returning the tree or something like that. So then disregarding the big O of one things, we have an n plus the while loop, which is an n times by two log n plus a constant plus another log n. And so that makes three log n. And so then if we were to go through this, we would say that, well, this is the dominating factor, not this one, because n times a factor of log n is more than just n by itself. And then likewise, this coefficient doesn't matter. So we would say that this is just big O of n log n, where n is like the number of different symbols that you can be given in the input text. So like merge sort or heap sort or anything else, uh, not anything else, but a lot of the algorithms we've looked at, this is an n log n algorithm. So that's the first and very important step of building this tree out for your text. The next thing that we're going to talk about is how do you actually get the code and do the encoding off of that. So we're gonna save that for the next video. So I'll see you next time for that. Thanks.